For those of you unfamiliar with Prony, we are the official archive of Northern Ireland. We were established in 1923. We have a remit to take public and private records, um, of which we held over 3 million, and our collections date back to 1219. Now, we have been in the space of marking centenaries back in 2011, and, and we have marked a number, starting with the Ulster Covenant, the First World War, Easter Rising, the Somme and Jutland, and we've invariably done them with our partners. And from 2011, we adopted the CRC's principles. Now, I'm not going to go through the principles. They're on the CRC's website. Um, for those of you who've been to a number of these events, you'll be familiar with them. There's along the lines of start from the historical facts, recognize the implications and consequences of what happens, understand different perceptions and interpretations, and show how events can deepen understanding of the period. Now, you can go and look at those yourself, so I'm not going to get into them in detail. And we applied these principles from the outset, i.e. you cannot explore the first the, so the Battle of the Somme without also simultaneously looking at the Easter Rising. So our first event that we did jointly was in 1911. We did that with um, at the Ulster Museum, and it was the first time ever that the um, proclamation was displayed um, with the a copy of one of the pages of the Ulster Covenant. And this one, I think, is Fred Crawford's signature signing the Covenant. Um, we have continued to deliver talks ourselves and do so at present. Since COVID um, overtook us, we have moved our engagement programme online and we have events um, regularly. Um, we have one with the Western Front Association once a month and we have a really strong lineup of speakers um, attending that. Um, uh, we've got um, Gary Sheffield, who's probably the foremost First World War historian in, in the British Isles. And then we've got Piet Chinans coming who is the curator for Enfield um, Flanders in Belgium, and he's speaking in uh, May. So the, 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 these, these, these carry on and will carry on, and we film them, because most of those events get put down. We have a capacity of 300, so we film them and we put them out on Prony's YouTube channel. And if you go to the Prony website and look up the YouTube page, you can go and see um, previous events and also ones that we filmed coming up. Um, Prony is a trusted digital archive, so we are in the game of preserving and archiving websites. And we have continued to do that um, for the websites that relate to the decade of centenaries, 1911 to 23. And here's one which was done, which was about Castleton Latins. Um, which History Hub Ulster um, delivered. Um, it's, it's one that we have on our site as well. In terms of um, sources, um, we were not unaware that um, the centenary of the Northern Ireland State and partition was coming upon us. So we put together a sources guide um, and this gives the major classes of records at Prony which are effectively, they're the DNA, the building blocks of what is the current Northern, what becomes Northern Ireland. These are the files that set up the state as it exists. So these are the records in the Prime Minister's office, the Cabinet Conclusions, the Treasury Division. These are the finance files and the finance department, Ministry of Finance was the ministry that financed the Northern Ireland government. Home Affairs, the setting up of the new police force. Um, and Ministry of Information, which gives some pictures of um, across, across the years. So I'm now going to um, mention, oh, I've, I've lost the page, the shock hour, um, that will never do. Um, so I'm now going to mention a few collections and documents, some of which I'm going to be showing for the first time ever. Um, some of them a bit more familiar. Now, this um document probably is familiar to quite a few folk you'll certainly have heard of it um it looks innocuous however it's very much the document that would go on to create um northern northern ireland the government of act ireland act uh, 1920 december 20 was intended to create a council of ireland it's intended to create parliaments 
in Northern and Southern Ireland, a Lord Lieutenant, who would be the chief executive for both regimes. In the end, in the end, this document only creates the state of Northern Ireland. So it takes another um, document, um, namely this one, which is um, known as the Irish Free State Agreement Act of 1922. Um, this act of the British Parliament passes on 31st of March 22 and gives the force of law to the 1921 Anglo-Irish Treaty and becomes a fully effective on 6th of December 22. So side by side, we've got the two, two of the signature documents that create the state of uh, Northern Ireland and later the Free State of Ireland. Not everybody was happy with these developments, as you know. Um, this is an example, this pamphlet outlines the plight of Southern Unionists, who would now be separated from Northern Unionists. It's a statement by Arthur Maxwell, the 11th Baron Farnham of County Cavan. Farnham had become the leading Southern Unionist at this point. And he tries to argue that the Southern Unionists, when added to the former members of the National Party, form a majority. Um, and this is why we should not have a Irish Free State. Um, Irish Nationalists um, are also unhappy for different reasons. Now, this is a poster issued before the general election in 1922. Um, and it argues that a vote for the Free State Government would, in effect, disestablish the any prospects of a Republic of Ireland and Ireland being a sovereign state. So um, not universally popular documents. Now, the big picture visual moment of partition is the opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament. And I suspect this will be the, th this and other images is what really you're gonna see in May and June of this year. I think a lot of the focus from probably the media documentary companies is going to be on this event. And this is of King George V and Queen Mary of Tech opening the first parliament of Northern Ireland. This is a hog photograph, so it's a bit more known than others. The King's opening of parliament really was a massive major media event, unheard of in terms of scale. This commemorative pamphlet um it's quite beautiful it's quite ornate just shows how it the event was choreographed um so we have the procession of the king and the queen this has all been choreographed to at we've got a checklist of all the great and the good lord lieutenant army officers the primate of all ireland the moderator of the general assembly at the bottom you'll see the luncheon i was hoping to see the menu here um, but um, alas, it wasn't coming. We do, though, have the details of the arrival at City Hall, and we have the details of the opening ceremony. So, I mean, it gives an idea of just the pomp of the event. Um, now, to cap it off, Prony received recently a photographic collection, and nobody's seen this. You are the first audience to see this ever, um, apart from the people who catalogued it. Um, and this is from a Martha Darling, whose husband, John Darling, was involved with the City Hall Guard at the official opening of Parliament in 1921. So this is, the, yeah, so this is a, a private person taking their own personal photographs. And um, includes photographs of um, various great and the good um, at the Parliament. There's ones of the London Dairies. There's ones of James Craig and his family. This is the Royal Box. Um, at the opening and various dignitaries, Londonderry, Duke Duchess of Abercorn, and Her Royal Highness, the Princess Mary, who looks pretty um, unimpressed, but um, that's, that's presumably how they look. Um, and there's Craig Avon and his party and others. Um, as we, um, like other archives, there's always treasures that we don't know about. Um, this file was of particular interest to us. You may, you probably can't read this because your eyesight's, um, uh, if your eyesight's like mine, what that says is Col Craig versus Collins correspondence. So this is, this is a series of 
um, letters and correspondence between Craig and Collins in 1922 from January 22 to um, basically to Collins' death in September 22. And it, it, it all starts off marvellously. This letter um, is from James Craig. Uh, um, is, um, he's writing from Cabin Hill. For any of you who don't know, the, when, when the Northern Ireland government was set up, it didn't have a home. So Craig and his secretariat um, took a short-term lease at Cabin Hill, which is the prep school for Campbell College, and based themselves out of there um, and did for not a long time, one to two years, I think, and then relocate to Stormont Castle, um, which has been refurbished. And there they would remain in the castle. Um, for a very, very long time whilst Parliament buildings gets built. Anyway, I go to what this letter says, and the most striking feature is just how cordial the correspondence is. Craig writes on 28th of January 1922, would it suit you if I came to Dublin and had a conversation with you on Friday next? I would propose to come to your office or any other place which you may suggest at two o'clock that afternoon and hope to catch the mail to London that night. If this should not be convenient, would you very kindly send me a telegram? So uh, even at this stage, well, the relationship there is definitely a relationship between the two government, the two um, the north and the, and the south, and the, certainly the leaders. And Craig himself, I mean, was quite a convivial person. Um, he he was a good he was a good per networker. He, he was somebody who could work with people. And I think this letter illustrates that now. Things don't stay like that. Next two letters, these are less agreeable. In this exchange, um, you can see how the violence that erupts in uh, Ireland uh, during the 21-22 period really puts a strain upon their relationship. Craig writes, um, the recent series of outrages committed by so-called Sinn Féiners um, against the property of Catholics in various districts in Northern Ireland is recognised by the latter as an effort to intimidate all those members of that faith. And it's interesting that Craig zooms in on, on Northern Catholics. The reply um, from Collins um, is slightly different. Um, Collins, so this is the reply. Collins is a, he sends basically a list of arson, murder and crime at the very centre of your seat of government. And he contrasts that 24 Catholics have been killed compared to 11 Protestants over the period from 1st of April 1922. And he notes that two of the Protestants killed were mistaken for Catholics and cites Protestant homes destroyed by loyalists. So interesting, Collins focuses on the Protestants. Um, here, uh, suffering Craig focuses on the Catholics. And I want to go back to the previous letter. And this is contains an interesting fact that isn't commonly known. One of the paragraphs that Craig writes, um, he mentions that he regrets that the government has been handicapped in suppressing crime, and he would, had hoped that the establishment of a Catholic constabulary force intended to protect Roman Catholic areas in Belfast would have been in operation before this date. So what Craig um, and Collins are effectively discussing is the creation of a second police force, which would almost mirror the you know, like what you have in the education, where we have two sets of um, schools, there would have been two sets of police forces, um, and that was um, seriously considered, and certainly was what Craig was looking towards. Now, I want to show you two telegrams. Um, the first telegram is actually one telegram. The, the, these are one telegram, um, dated 12th of August 22. It's from William Thomas Cosgrove to James Craig, where he regrets to inform you of the sad news that President Arthur Griffith died this morning after a short illness. Now, the three weeks later, Craig gets um, sent another um, telegram. This is the 1st of September 22. And this is Craig acknowledging the death of Collins. Um, Sir James Craig, Prime Minister of Belfast, begged to gratefully acknowledge your message of sympathy in the loss Ireland has sustained through death of General Michael Collins, signed by Cosgrove as chairman. Right, I want to send, I'm going to show you one last item because I'm running out of time. And this is the most important and best document you'll ever see um, in 
today, uh, anyway. And it's from the Ministry of Finance. It's to the court service in Dublin. And in it, um, the Minister of Finance writes, sorry, the, the, in it, the writer writes, I am directed by the Minister of Finance to request you to draw the attention of the Prime Minister to the operation of the Government of Ireland Act, 1920, Section 9, Subsection 2, Proviso B, as modified by subsequent legislation. Under this enactment, provision may be made to the Governor of NI upon the establishment of a public record office in Northern Ireland. Um, and then the letter then uh, gives approval for the removal to that office of such probate letters of administration, other testamentary records. So this is Prony's first, this is the letter that authorizes Prony's first um, deposit of records and leads into the um, anniversary, which is totally eclipses any other anniversary you'll hear mentioned today, which is the anniversary of the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland in 1923.